All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. We're here in Bangkok live today with Jamin Yerger and Matt Kowalik from High Cap'n. Uh, Matt's been on the show, I think, probably a year ago. So today we're going to talk about Canton Fair since it's coming up next week. And I know some listeners are going. So uh, these guys are the guys you want to see when you're there. So we're going to go over a little bit about a quick primer on what this event's about. So Matt actually did an episode with Dan Andrews over at Tropical MVA about kind of the history of Canton Fair. But today we're going to go into the nitty gritty of when you're actually there. What the hell do you do? Because it's a fucking shit show from what I've heard. So Yeah, it's uh, it's super intimidating. You know, the Canton Fair is, I think they say there's uh, five football fields worth of, uh, of suppliers at every show. And uh, so it can be a lot of confusion. It's very intimidating. I think the key to success here is laying a good foundation and, and planning ahead of time as much as possible. All right, so one thing when people want to get into sourcing is that they could either go to China themselves or go to the Canton Fair, right? So on a very high level, what would be like the pros and cons for choosing Canton Fair over, say, visiting it yourself? Well, I think there's a couple of options as well. You know, the Canton Fair is is the largest trade show in China, but it's definitely not the only one. Um, global Sources does a lot of shows in Hong Kong, and there's a big difference between the Global Sources shows and the Canton Fair show. So the Canton Fair, uh, again, just briefly, the history of it, it's kind of the government-sponsored um, all factories in China kind of trade show. And, and historically, it was the only place you could go to source products from China um, when China was closed, you know, hundreds of years ago, even up to before the 50s. So the, the Canton Fair is kind of everything and everybody from everywhere. You are going factory direct there, which also has pros and cons, right? You're going to get great pricing for a lot of things, but it's also going to, you're going to have to do a lot more project management by yourself. You're going to have to take more responsibility for understanding the process and controlling everything. And the factories will probably be very specialized and good at what they do, but they will probably only be strictly manufacturing. There will not be a lot of, of kind of the accompanying services that come around with, with sourcing. So it it is the kind of best option for getting the best factory direct pricing but there's a lot more difficulty as well there's a lot of people who maybe aren't exactly what they claim to be there's a lot of sourcing agents pretending to be suppliers there's a lot of um, government owned factories or suppliers who are there who you know just have that money in their budget and have to spend it and aren't really looking for new customers and don't really care about getting new customers and there's a lot of people who will tell you they can make anything they'll build you a rocket ship if you ask for it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they can do it so the global sources shows are a lot easier you're in hong kong it's a little more friendly there's a lot of english spoken but your pricing is going to be a lot higher for the most part and you're not probably not necessarily going factory direct unless you have pretty big orders. Why is factory direct pricing better there than say if you went up to their door? Well, what do you mean up to the door? You mean up to the factory itself? Yeah, like if I just fly to the city and I actually visit them. Well, I think that may be harder or said than done mm -hmm. because to actually find these suppliers, maybe you can get on a, a popular format of like uh, alibaba.com, right? And you could find that specific factory for that material and you can go visit it and uh, Maybe you could, I think you could get the same price, but the disadvantage is, is that you spend all that money to come to China to visit one spot, or maybe if you're lucky, three. Unless you're spending maybe like uh, two weeks, you know, one week would be a short time to come to China and see three suppliers because the suppliers are really not in a city center usually. You're going to spend a lot of time on the road. There's there's a lot of factors that you don't encounter into is that you might be able to go to see a supplier and get a quote, but do you really need to fly that many miles and spend that much money yeah. just to see one factory. Now, the advantage of going to a Canton Fair or um, a Global Sources show in Hong Kong is that they're all in one spot and you can go see many things and, and try to like get the biggest comparison. So you're kind of doing a nice big, uh, you kind of go into the grocery store and you're getting a lot of stuff to compare, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things to, to, to look at and get new ideas as well. So it's like if I'm buying watermelons, I can have like the yellow kinds or red kinds uh, next to each other. Big and small, well. mm -hmm. s tasty and not tasty. <laughs> right, right, Everything. Right. I think, yeah, I mean, the, going to the, the big advantage of the trade show is you can go there and cast a very wide net and get... Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of ideas from pricing from a lot of different suppliers. They're kind of at the trade shows. They're usually showing their newest products, their newest innovations on everything. So you can maybe even get some ideas that you didn't have before or some tweaks on whatever product you're looking for. Kind of like uh, chumming the waters a little bit. You know, you're, you're kind of 
putting out your product and seeing who who wants to make it, who's willing to offer a better price. Um, and that's kind of the advantage of being in China is these areas that are these regions that are highly specialized in a type of product. Um, because intellectual property protection in China is not super advanced, the, the pricing in China is very cutthroat because everybody's looking to, to kind of get that get that order and get that deal. So you can really kind of start up a good bidding war and get pretty good pricing from uh, from a lot of different suppliers. Mm. So I think that's a good advantage. So in terms of like a product idea, how well do you need to know the supply chain? Because I think they don't want to talk to someone who has no idea what they're doing. Like, it's just a random idea. But also if you know it well enough, do you really need to be there? Is there like a middle ground for this? or? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it depends on, yeah, exactly, how much help you need kind of developing your idea. If you just have an idea in your head, you know, I, I usually recommend people to bring a physical product of something that's similar because you can at least use that as a base and uh, and kind of pivot from there. Show them, oh, I want it like this, but I want to make these changes here, here, and here. Um, yeah. At these shows, they'll have salespeople, they'll have engineers on staff um, that can kind of help you tweak those products. And, and having that, that physical product with you and knowing what you're looking for, knowing the features that you're looking for, is also a good way to evaluate the suppliers and try to separate who is a uh, sourcing agent and who's a real factory. Because if you start talking to a sourcing agent and you get in the details of the product and they're like, oh, well, yes, uh, 6,000 series aluminum and 7,000 series aluminum, all the same thing, same thing. Yeah. Well, that's not true at all. 7,000 is a lot more expensive. So you can kind of use that and leverage your way of figuring out who is going to be a supplier who really knows what they're talking about and really is going to be somebody that's going to be a better fit for you and your product. Gotcha. So if you don't have a physical sample, would a photo do? Or? Kind kind of, but mm. at the same time, like if you, if you are a guy with just an idea or, or a girl and you don't really know what you're doing, you don't have a drawing, or, or you have a picture, but you don't know what yeah. that picture entails to make, if you're asking a supplier to engineer, create something for you, you're going to you're going to have a really hard time getting that product made. And if they do, it will be theirs. I see what you mean. But like yeah. you need to have the vision of what you want it to be, not yeah, just hoping right. someone well, can make it for you. Right. I mean, you can do that, but realize that if they're paying for the tooling, they're going to see that as their product and they'll sell it to somebody else if they yeah. can. So that's another way to be very kind of cautious is um, if you're coming up with like an innovative new product or something like that and, and they, know their mar they know your market as well, um, you could be uh, inspiring slash creating competitors as well. So I think that's something to be kind of very, very careful with. So how would someone like protect themselves against that? Can you even protect yourself against that, or you can? I think that there, you know, again, it's it's not most of the time that the, the intellectual property problems that we see in China usually are are instigated by the Western buyers, the foreign buyers. Mm -hmm. They come in and they've got some Nike shoes or a GoPro or whatever, and they say, "Hey, I want to do something like this and make a couple changes." Right. So they're basically taking oh, somebody else's product and making mm -hmm. tweaks. And in China, there isn't that expectation that okay, this is somebody else's design. I probably can't copy this. Uh, the factories are kind of slowly becoming aware of this, um, especially the bigger guys because they've kind of bumped into this before. Um, and intellectual property protection and rights in China is developing pretty quickly, but it's still taking time. So I think um, the best way to protect yourself is to be very upfront and very clear about who is paying for the engineering who's paying for the design, who's paying for mold fees, and who's going to own that product and, and that style in the future. You know, if you, if you come with just an idea and you ask that factory to build it, they rightly so are going to see that as theirs because they're fronting a lot of cost and time there. So, and production um, value and engineering costs and things, yeah. And are most of them willing to pay for like molding fees and all these things too? Or mm, most no. I would say, right? yeah, it's very yeah. rare. And if they do, that's a red flag because yeah. they probably are going to take that idea. <laughs> they see you see your idea is valuable. <laughs> no, right. yeah, I don't want to paint that light. But if if going back to your question, if, if someone believes they have an innovative product, um, let's just say some kind of innovative teacup. Yeah. You know, um, we actually worked with a, a guy who had a very innovative teacup that was built on a certain mold that when you turned it one way, it seeped the tea and when it turned when you leaned it the other way uh, it took it out of of the tea leaves and it just mm -hmm. was water now he kind of took he didn't let every person sign an nda but what he did do is that he went and did his his proper paperwork of getting things uh, registered within china yeah and in the other countries that he was going to 
that he was going to sell this at. So while while you can't worry about getting everyone to sign NDAs and making sure people don't copy your idea, if you prepare first to cover your cover your ass to say is that that you would be able to make sure that if something that like that does happen, you have something to play with at that point. Right, you're giving yourself uh, cards, cards to, play. To, to to play in the future. You know, putting all this into a contract at the beginning and kind of following a very you can get somebody to sign an NDA and whatever. But the truth is, is in Asia, is your relationship is your greatest security against something like that being happening. If they believe you're going to place good size, consistent orders, and you're fairly easy to work with. That's your best intellectual property protection right there. You know, if you're willing, you know, you you meet with the supplier and you sit down, you have dinner, chat about their kids, you bring them some coloring books or whatever. Building that strong, stable relationship is the best way to kind of protect yourself. It's not like in the West where you're like, well, you signed this piece of paper, so you promised me this product, this price, you have to deliver it. If the deal doesn't make sense anymore, they're not going to do it, you know, and that's just the way it is in, in, in Asia for the most part. Yeah, gotcha. So say if someone has like a product idea, they know how much it retails. So how did they even start reverse engineering this whole supply chain if they were to go to Canton Fair? Well, it's difficult and it depends on what your how you're trying to sell that product. If you're trying to go direct B to C, you really need to work backwards and understand what's your packaging costs, what's your shipping costs. Um, what type of pricing are you getting from the factory? Is it X works? Is it... X factory is it CIF is it FOB all of these different uh, types of pricing include different things right X factory means yeah the products finished and now it's sitting on the floor in a factory in the middle of China okay well now what you still got to pick it up you still got to move it to the docks you still got to load it on a boat you still got to get it inspected it has to go through customs customs ship it, fees blah, blah, blah. Custom yeah, don't forget fees, that yeah. custom fees export <laughs> fees yeah that's the big thing too is is to be super cautious about is what type of factory are you working with do they have an export license are they allowed to export you might get a great price from somebody but you find out that they're a domestic supplier that's only uh, licensed to, to, to manufacture and sell into China when they finish selling your or manufacturing your product they'll hand it to you and be like good luck getting it out of China now and and unless you're going to be able to turn around and sell it in China you're really in a tough spot so really doing your research up front understanding what price you're getting quoted at understanding how are you going to transport that to the do- to the to the uh, port? I think most people don't think that far ahead. They just think, I just want to make five thousand units, and then we'll figure it and out. They figure out what the quote is at that point. Yeah, and they go, okay, uh, the the unit costs five bucks. Oh, that's a lot. Of, oh, that's great. We can make great profit. Right, I'm gonna sell it for yeah. twenty five. Well, okay, well, you know that you still got a lot of other costs in there, so you really need to understand what your total landed to the, your warehouse cost is, yeah. and then you still got to think about, all right, now it's in your warehouse. You guys still got to pay shipping fees and taxes and all that stuff wherever you're selling it to. So, really understanding that total cost is is a big part of the research you should do before you try to bring it to China. Not every product, not every quantity of products is going to be a good fit for China. You know, so many people, you know, China's kind of viewed as the world's factory these days, but not every product is a great fit for China. China, in China, quantity is king. They want big orders, big volume. And that all comes back from having 20% of the world's population in one country. They all need jobs. They all need work. They all need something to do. So, a lot of these big factories, it's kind of the funny thing, you know, when you get people that come to China, you see, you know, you go out to dinner and you've got six people sitting at the table and there's 10 waiters, you know, for this table of six people. <laughs> so just kind of understanding that mindset that, you know, there, there's a lot of people that need work and a lot of people that need to be employed. So you really need to know exactly what you're what you're looking for. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up with the FOB stuff because when I was doing this last year, so say something gets made for five bucks, by the time it got to my warehouse in the U.S., it was probably like another three, with everything like the duties, oh, yeah. like freight, like yeah, freight packing. Yeah, it was probably like maybe is it like ballpark twenty percent more? Probably would that be a safe place to say? Or? It can be depending on uh, depending the on your product. Yeah, right, right. it also depends yeah. on the volume. Yeah, you know, if you're doing twenty thousand units, that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, tax and duty costed to exit the country versus you know a hundred quantity of something. Right. Yeah. You are, know, are you think of our friends Dan and Ian who ship steel for the cat furniture stuff. Right. I mean, they're assembling in the US, right? So right, right, right. That's really well, another thing too, right? Are yeah. you oh, we had a one of our first big kind of crazy orders was uh we had a promotional flip-flop order for these guys in Russia <laughs> and uh yeah, yeah. and they wanted, you know, a quarter million pairs of flip-flops. We had to ship them as unassembled into into Russia and um so 
we had to make the flip flop part and sell and, and ship them separately from the little toe hold mm-hmm. plastic part on top and send them all these tools for them to manually assemble a quarter million pairs of flip flops and I mean it was uh, you know but sell, sh- shipping the flip flops as assembled product didn't make sense the the cost and the duty would be too high to make the deal work so they had to yeah. ship them as unassembled parts and figure out how to assemble them and themselves. ship them in different ways right. The bottom part went by rail, and then the top oh part God. went by Disaster. went by, yeah. by ocean. That's the cost model that they figured out because right. the, the duties and everything made more sense. So yeah. this is, again, a, another warning to really understand what's the total cost to getting that product manufactured in China, landed to your warehouse or, or you know Amazon or wherever you're, you're shipping it to. You need to understand all of these costs, and if you don't understand these things, don't expect the factory to step up and be like, well, have you thought about this, blah, blah, blah. They're looking to just manufacture. That's what they do. Yeah. If they knew how to ship and, and, and market and do whatever, they'd be selling their brand in, China, in the U.S. Yeah, themselves. So Yeah, so when it, when it comes to duties, in my experience, my supplier would always under-declare the values. Is that a common practice? Or, yes. Because I know that if you declare too low, customers can determine what's the, yeah, what they they'll think they'll make a decision for like. you. But there's... Yeah, there's usually like kind of a, I, I don't advocate it uh, yeah. on it here, but I'd say half of the price of you can, what you're. You can ask are. your supplier, really. Yeah, exactly. But realize that the lower you go, the more risk you're taking, and it's, it's like uh, taxation, right? You're you're stacking, you're you're staking out a position, and then you're gonna maybe have to defend it, maybe not. So realize that the the lower you try to push that duty, the more risk you're gonna have of. Of customs pulling your stuff aside, doing calling a your, very calling attention yeah. to yourself, or doing a very thorough inspection of the goods, and then uh, reassessing the cost of duty. Plus, from country to country, it varies. From product to product, it varies. You know, if you're importing wood or something, there's uh, different regulations, fees, things like that. right? Yeah. So, yeah. at least talking to a customs broker or something like that is is very important. And these things are very easy to do. You know, there's a ton of freight forwarders. There's a ton of these third-party services that are kind of built around sourcing in China that can really help you out, whether that's inspection, testing, um, freight forwarding, customs paperwork. Somebody will do all this for you. We ship to, I don't even know, 35, 40 different countries, all kinds of different products. and We you certainly know, don't remember everything I, ourselves. Right. Yeah. You know, we, have, we have forwarders and agents that are specialized, even specialized down to a product where we use this agent for this product. Because they they're specialized, you know. So you, if you're working in like possibly cosmetics, there's a cosmetics forder that's gonna you're gonna want to work with rather than a person who just ships out widgets. Yeah. You know. And usually these services are priced pretty reasonably. I mean, yeah. everybody kind of understands where they fit in the in the supply chain. Uh, you know where their position is, so the fees are reasonable. They're usually a small percentage, and, and there's so much competition. Again, that's the best thing about China is there's so many people doing the same work that it drives that pricing point to kind of a, a, a stable level where everybody has to charge about the same amount. You know, and depending on what the service that you need and how much help you're going to need um, depends on what kind of service you're going to get. But that being said, you know, using us the the cheapest quote every time if something does go wrong do not expect a lot of help service wise we had a customer who was shipping a lot of batteries from australia and they worked with somebody to book a position on a front on a on a ship and basically what they do is they take that huge huge container ship and they chop it up into different sections and somebody bids on those sections and they chop it down further and further and further to these different freight forwarders and all they're looking to do is book that space so what happened is batteries are considered dangerous good because there's acid and all kinds of issues yeah somebody misdeclared what the product was and those batteries sat in a a port in shaman or something for six months batteries were worthless guy paid for the full container hot summer they completely discharged lead acid batteries they're worthless did it it hold the whole shipment no just the container container. Yeah. yeah Just yeah, just a container, but that was their container. I think about fifty thousand U.S. dollars worth, yeah. and now it was worthless. De- decharge can't recharge them. Uh, fact, and factory said, "I'm not taking them back." I just made it. Right? Yeah, right. I just right. made it, and uh, you know, and, and the freight forwarder didn't want to take any responsibility. It's a hot either. potato game. Right. 
and they could never get an answer until the guy, poor guy came over and we helped him figure it out. But um, even then, it was still like, well... Helped him figure out that he lost $50,000. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to get up. paid somehow. <laughs> yeah. So when these guys starting out, like, how would you research your custom duties? Do you go to like, this is just HTS code or is there anything else or... You would have um, you would have a code that you that your product would that would be classified. Right. Every country's got a, a full list of everything. You can talk to a customs broker and try to get an idea of what type of product you're looking at. But basically, they just send you out a list of all these products and say these batteries or this stuff with this. It's called product. a Harmony Sourcing Code (HS right. Code). Right. So there'll be a list for every country, and they'll talk about exactly what duty it is and. Again, it's you're you're again you're you're playing a game here where you're like, okay, well, I think my batteries are more like this, and this one or my products like yeah. this, and it's a little bit cheaper. Do I want to pay this even though the actual product might be closer to something else? You can play that game if you want to, but realize if you get caught, there's fines and all kinds of stuff waiting for you. So yeah, or if you want to assemble it later to split the input duty because right. it's as raw material, right. it's a little different. Or yeah. there's different regulations on. Um, what where it considers a product is actually made from you can buy parts yeah. from somewhere else and assemble them somewhere else and it requires a certain percentage of the assembly to happen in one country to be a product from them they used to play this game too in uh, in Hong Kong so you could ship your product to Hong Kong have the packaging done there um, sent back to China and shipped out from there and it would be um, you know assembled in Hong Kong and that's a different duty rate for going into different countries, but I think most of that stuff's kind yeah, of... Yeah, that's something that I realized with, like, genuine leather. They said it only needs to be, like, what, 55%? And sometimes on jacket, it's only that one piece where the tag is. Right. That's genuine. And uh, I mean, they're not lying, but right. the whole jacket isn't genuine. It's right, just that exactly. one tag you're holding it at. Right. And you're just like, look. <laughs> <laughs> that's a genius. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I could have sold more and more of those type of jackets. Yeah, I know, right? Maybe we're in the wrong business. All right, so we talked about customs... Uh, kind of getting started. So you guys mentioned a Venn diagram before we started. Right. Uh, what's, so what's this deal about? There's kind of the uh, the, the the golden triangle of, of of product sourcing from China that you really need to be think careful about. And we usually talk about it as a Venn diagonal diagram. Three overlaying circles of price, quality, and the speed of manufacturing. And we usually tell our customers you need to focus on the two of the three most important ones. Do you need the absolute best price? and the quality and the speed is not as important or you need good quality and fast turnaround but you're willing to pay a higher price. Um, so usually it, it's kind of like a scale, a three-way scale and you need to find, you need to understand exactly what you're looking for and what your kind of most important parts are. If it's just one and you're like, I just need the best quality product like this, I don't really care about the pricing, I don't care how long it takes to make it. Um, that becomes easier actually to deal with. Yeah. Right. And, and also much easier to explain to a supplier when you sit down with them because they're going to offer you this. Sure, you can go, you can show up to the trade show and get pricing for everything, but that pricing can be misleading. We just, I was just talking to a, another sourcing partner of ours before uh, today, and they got a bunch of pricing for a product over the Chinese New Year holiday or the Chinese National Day holiday. And he goes back to his client, sells the project. He comes back after the holiday. The person, who, you know, the sales rep at the factory who gave him that price got fired, isn't working there anymore. A new guy comes in, hey, it's 20% more expensive. He's out $7,000 US because he already sold the product to his client and he's got to move forward with it. Nobody else can quote at that same product. So not the, the there's a lot of this bait and switch that happens, not as much as used to, but sometimes still quite a bit where they underbid a project purposely to try to get you stuck where you've already made the promise to your client or you've already paid a deposit and they switch it. So really trying to understand exactly what you're looking for and making sure that you're communicating accurately to the suppliers what your requirements, what your needs are, um, exactly what material you need, exactly what type of plastic, what type of metal, um, so that you're making an apples to apples comparison between supplier quotes and you're not, oh, well, this guy said it's super cheap. Well, what are they quoting? You know, what exactly did they just see a picture of some product? Well, sure, I can quote something out. It doesn't mean I can actually deliver that product at that quantity on time for that price. Yeah. So in terms of like communicating with a supplier, like now in 2014, China's been making the world's stuff for what 40, 50 years now. So mm -hmm. you probably have some second generation people in the family in these factors. And are they? Do they have good English or like what are we dealing with here? With kind of like it's the usually the sale. They usually they have sales teams, mm 
Um, the more advanced, bigger facilities will have English sales teams, and they'll be kind of responsible for your day-to-day -day emails back and forth, and you're dealing with them. The problem is with that is that they are salespeople, and that's it. They're not engineers, and they're not the boss. You know, so sometimes you know that leads to like slower quotes, um, inaccurate details or specifications because they're trying to sell a product or, or just or maybe they're just inexperienced. Like they don't know if certain things can be done. They need to go ask the engineer and yeah, ask yeah, the exactly. boss if the price is okay. Yeah, exactly. What we're trying to do yeah, there. exactly. It can't happen right away. Yeah. You know, they don't have the they don't have the, the, the breadth to be able to do such a thing. They're just they've basically been hired because they speak English. Yeah. Not because they're good salespeople, not because they know the product. They just fit a need at that point. You know, so that's not that's not for every facility. You know, um, if you're going again, the Canton Fair versus kind of like a um, sourcing in Hong Kong, global sources, global yeah. sources that will be very English friendly and more services, but also expect to pay probably twenty percent more. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the same thing. I mean, we specifically look for suppliers that have no website, no English speaking sales staff, because all of that stuff ends up being built into your price. You know, yeah. and, and we can do that because we have that skill. We have an on the ground team. That's our, you know, that's where our skill set is. So, um, depends on how advanced you want to get. But yeah, you can go to the Global Sources show and find a reasonable price to get started with. And if you're quantities increase and you can you feel like you're getting want to get a little more adventurous you can go out and find a supplier who doesn't have maybe that same english speaking skill set or sales reps or whatever and if you're willing to take more responsibility on the project management side yes then you can find quite a, a cheaper price but the other side is you know you're you're going to have to deal with more stuff on your own and if there are problems it, it's going to be your responsibility and um i mean that's one of the advantages for us is if there is a problem we're at that factory the next day yeah. physically on the floor asking for somebody to explain to us what happened and, and, and where things went sideways yeah so when you talk to a factory is it pretty normal to talk to a salesperson or because for me i talk to the owner directly because it was a small company but now i talk to a salesperson but Generally speaking, is it a salesperson you usually go through, or what's like the hierarchy? Usually, like? yeah, mm -hmm. and like on your first contact, usually if you're contacting them, um, if you're contacting them at the Canton Fair, or if you're contacting them at Alibaba, it will be a salesperson for sure mm -hmm. at the very beginning, unless it's a very small factory, yeah. and it's, um, like you said, it's a second generation savvy guy who's mm -hmm. trying to open up his own business, he speaks some English, you know, and then that's a very small factory and that could be a really good relationship like like you've developed with yeah. yours you know you, it's a small company it fits your specific need and and the quantities that you make and and also it's 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 the relationship that you're able to to do work yeah with. it's funny like she asked me about like pinterest social media how to use adwords stuff like that's kind of cool so, yeah it's interesting well yeah this is how email marketing works you should build an email list and yeah well be careful because she'll be <laughs> your competitor yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah well she's trying to find more people to do OEM work for herself. Right. But not like, I guess competitors for me, but. Well, I mean, I mean it, it is what it is. You know, I mean, yeah. all these guys eventually are going to start trying to get out there and, and find more things to, to kind of do. But China's also slowly losing some of their competitiveness competitiveness as well you know to the yeah. philippines to vietnam to some yeah. of these other places where the labor costs are so much lower um that they can have competitors but i mean again all those raw materials are still being made in china anyway so you're yeah, still exactly. shipping them from somewhere else yeah and for them they could probably just add the service into that as a value at then going to vietnam and trying to find anything right on your own too yeah all right cool so Going on to this talking about factories thing, um, when would it make more sense to use an agent rather than factory direct? I think an agent is valuable when you, maybe there's a couple situations. One, you don't have a complete grasp on maybe what the product is or, or what goes into making the product and that agent has that technical skill, you know, and they're providing that like value added there where they, they know what they're looking for they possibly already sell or produce that that good for other customers at the same time. So they're they're basically taking that that skill and putting it off to someone else. Or two, you have a business to run and you don't want to manage uh, a, a factory. Yeah. And uh, and so like uh, an a a good agent can also be a kind of a service provider, meaning that they're your your ears on the ground because you're paying them to get the job done. So they're completing the tasks of 
maybe communicating uh, the correct things to the facility, um, getting samples made for you and, and receiving the samples and, and being closer to that instead of, you know, them maybe sending the sample, then send it to America and then send it back and making calls, you know, so maybe you can save some time there. So those are the kind of the two situations. One's they're providing a skill or two, they're, they're filling in uh, that agent role as kind of like um, that admin that you don't have or, or want to possibly take responsible for, run yeah. some responsibility for. Because you're managing like 20 suppliers. You don't want to be the guy emailing everyone. Yeah, to figure all this stuff out. Yeah, too. I mean, we've had some uh, some crazy projects like that. We did a, a skateboard project for a company in Brazil where we were managing I don't know what eleven suppliers for one project. So for the skateboard, we had somebody to do the wheels and somebody to do the grip tape, somebody to make the skateboard, somebody to make the trucks, the bolts, the, screw the trucks into the yeah, bolts. oh and yeah, the plastic, yeah. the, the, the plastic ring, yeah. one plastic ring that goes into in the, the truck, right? Yeah, in the truck, exactly. Yeah. We we source that by itself <laughs> but, but but for us to do that instead of going to a one manufacturer who would do all of that together we save 30 percent you know 30 percent on a, on a large order like that end up being thousands and thousands of dollars so mm. for us you know that's something that i can make these decisions and hand it off to our production team and they run with it i'm not communicating with these suppliers yeah. so it makes sense for us but if you didn't have that capability you know you wouldn't even be able to do that project. So to be able to go to an agent who's like, hey, I one-stop shop for everything, you can turn around and focus on marketing and sales of your business. Um, another thing, too, is a lot of these agents will have a long-term, better-developed relationship with that supplier where maybe their, uh, their cousin used to, you know, gave this guy a loan and helped him get his business started. So he'll do a 50-piece order for you when his regular minimum order is 300, you know, and, and, and an agent may able to be able to get you in there and, and do smaller projects or they may be able to offer engineering services or something like that where there's a strong value added. I always tell people when you're thinking about using an agent, what is that value added? Are they just getting you a price? Um, will they let you inspect the, the, the facility on your own? I think if, if you're going to find a good solid agent and you say hey look I, I do want to work with you I just need to look at this facility I, I want to make sure that you know there's no kids running around this thing I mean even today I've, I've gone to some facilities where the kids are hanging out in the factory after school or something maybe not working or whatever but doing their homework on a factory assembly floor or whatever and you know it's just something where depending on what your needs are um, you can kind of discuss with a with an agent and see you know are they adding a legitimate service or are they just standing in the way and being a middleman and adding a value, or adding product pricing to your product just to be able to do it and find a factory? Gotcha. So when you talk about pricing, what's like the typical way they, the agents earn money? Is it just a margin off the top? Or yeah, a margin off the top. The and, and probably a margin on top of your side and probably a kickback from the factory. So he built it in when he gives you the pricing, basically. For the most part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you negotiate, in that sense he'll basically have a certain level that he won't go under. Or Do you have a negotiating room when you go through an agent? Or how does um, that really work? I think, I think it can't be too low. I mean, mm. you can't drive him down to the bottom because then, then the project is no longer um, valuable to him or her. Yeah. And then they won't really look at it anymore. So you definitely have to come to a price that you both feel comfortable with. And if you're just driving him down... And you find you got the price you want, but then you, he he or she didn't get the price they wanted. The value and the kind of uh, the tension of your product goes way down. Yeah, I mean they're just gonna cut corners to to find that cost. They're gonna substitute materials, yeah. or they're not gonna do QC, or the project gets put on the back burner and they don't really care if it gets finished at all. Because once you've got your deposit in, then they kind of can put the screws to you because you're, you've are you got skin in the game now. So I always go back to that. I don't know if you remember a couple years ago when they had all those problems with the drywall in the U.S. that was getting shipped. It mm. was crumbling and smelled like rotten, smelled like rotten fish or something yeah. like that. The, the, the buyer had pushed the pricing so low that the pricing was actually below the cost of the raw materials for that product now if you if you're one thing i've learned in china is nobody ever sells you something that they're not going to make a profit at no matter what they yeah. say you're going to hear this all the time for factory oh i'm not making any money i'm not I'm making losing any money ah yeah. oh, you're killing me you're losing, I'm losing yeah. money that's nobody never, loses that's money. never yeah. true right? neither do we <laughs> yeah. but for the most point i mean the, there is a slight concern there because again going back to understanding what 
their mentality is is sometimes they have to keep those machines running right if the machines stop running it's not that they're not making profit they're losing money by not running those machines so sometimes they'll take bigger volume projects that they're not making as much profit on because they have to keep those things moving so if you do have a higher volume project you do have more um, negotiation and more leverage it's not necessarily that um, the, the supplier is going to make a ton more profit, but for them, it's insurance that, all right, everybody's going to get paid. The workers aren't going to go on strike. I'm not going to have to screw these guys over. Um, and, and that's uh, you know a benefit for them. We have a couple of clients where we take the projects on at a lower percentage, a lower profit margin than we usually would do because the volume's high enough that we know we need to feed some of these to our suppliers to keep them happy that they can run these high volumes per one SKU and then they'll turn around and help us out at the lower ones where we're making a much higher percentage. Gotcha. So to understand this right, you're better off giving them a margin than squeezing everything out and then have them cut corners to build the margin for themselves. Definitely. And I think that, you know, it, if you're really trying to press them, you, you really don't have a ton of leverage unless you got good volume, right? Yeah. They don't care so much about doubling the price if to do a hundred. Uh, they want they'd much rather do a thousand, right? So even if they're going to make that same amount of profit on a hundred and a thousand, they want that volume, not yeah. a higher profit because it's piece. a splash in the pan versus you know stability of a month, mm-hmm. you know? right? And they have to pay the workers. The workers usually get paid on a per piece value. So whether you, you, you say, oh, I'm going to pay double for that small order, you know, that doesn't pay the the worker who only gets paid per piece. Right, and again, so it's a they're, volume game. they're going to have to shut off the machines and they're not running, so they're losing money, one. And two, not only do they have to pay the workers per piece, but they need to retain those workers. They need to have enough work to keep those guys busy because otherwise they're going to go home at Chinese New Year and not come back because... You know, living in these factory towns in China is is not great. So if they can take that money or they can earn similar money working their farm back home, they'd much rather do that than sit in a factory all day. So it's an opportunity cost, right? They have to have, they have to provide their workers with a good enough opportunity. I mean, um, we see it all the time now when you drive around the factories. Everybody's looking help on and help on and help on. They can't find enough people to work in the factories because they're just not able to necessarily keep those. The, the quantity's high enough and, and the machine's operating and running. Yeah. So we talk about quantities. I think everyone kind of knows like MOQs are kind of negotiable, but so say, sure. say someone says 500 MOQ, what is like a good order to base off that number? Because I think when you're starting out, you see the MOQ number, but you don't know what's a big order or a small order. You only see that number. Is there a way to like extrapolate this from like a certain number? Or? I Well, I mean, from product to product, I think that's really hard yeah, to I mean, say. Yeah. I mean, there's some products where there's definitely hard lines on, on MOQs. Like for example, packaging. Mm-hmm. Like packaging won't be below the thousands. Right. And if you're going to do it below mm-hmm. the thousands, it's just a, probably a small print shop and it'll cost you out the nose. But then as you're saying, you know, you see a place that says 500, oh, but we'll do 100. And that's fine, but it won't last for very long. Yeah. So, so when it won't last for very long, what would be a big order for them if they say 500, like 2,000, 10,000, 20,000? That's hard to know. Yeah, it's going to vary yeah. so much. It depends on the size of the factory, the product, the material, all these kinds of things. I mean, there's so many components that go into making that. You're not really going to know. And mm-hmm. some might say 500 and they're like, okay, I'll concede and go down to 400. Some might say 500 and say, okay, I can do 100, right? So it's weird because I'll get quotes from a supplier where it says, MOQ, 3,000 pieces. Here's your pricing for 500, 2,000, 1,000. I'm like, well, that's not a minimum order quantity if you're going to quote me three prices below that minimum yeah. order, right? So uh, it is negotiable for the most part, and some people stand harder than others, and some people say, I will not go below this. And some guys are like, well, I mean, the minimum order doesn't really even mean anything to them. Yeah, like one thing I noticed is that MOQs. You might as well try different quantities just to get different quotes because, like packaging, if you're getting like 500 boxes, a thousand boxes at the minimum, you could probably order like 5,000 to pay the same amount because it scales. Some things scale better, right? And oh, definitely with packaging yeah. too, right? You know, you buy if you know you're going to keep ordering that same product, you're going to need it. It makes a lot of sense to order a higher volume and, and keep those. We do that for a lot of our customers where 
you know, all right, you're going to order these at 500, but I know you're going to keep running these things. If we order 2000, the price is like two thirds the price of 500. So it yeah. makes sense to buy these. You might as well buy more. You might as just, well buy 2000 yeah. and just sit there and use them. Even if you don't use them, you're going to save so much money that you can get rid of them and, and it's still going to be cheaper than buying 500. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, when they see MLQ, you got to like just poke around. You just got to keep asking, keep yeah. asking, please, you know, negotiate, try to tell them your story, give them a little more whatever. And if, if they're willing to at least consider it, you know, you're, you're finding a good, a good partner. And that goes again with trying to suss out who is going to be a good match for you at the, at these trade shows, right? When you're looking for a supplier, you want to ask how big are they? What's the facility look like? You know, if you're going to try to take a, a hundred piece wallet order and the factory is like, Oh, I got 2000 workers. Yeah. that's not going to be a good fit for you long term, right? If you're trying to do one order, maybe that's fine. Um, but if you're not going from a hundred orders up to like 2000 pieces in a couple of months, the factory is just going to lose interest because they got 2000 mouths to feed 2000 people that have to have jobs every, every, every day. So I think that the first step when, when going to these trade shows is to really understand your product, understand what it's made out of, What's the pricing for these materials, these raw materials? That saves you a lot of time negotiating. And then you go out and you find the suppliers that you think are going to be a good match, a good fit size-wise. Are they interested in your project? If you're if you're trying, if you're begging a big factory to do the order, you just don't long term. You don't have any leverage. They're not going to pay attention to it. If there's problems, they're not going to want to fix it. Um, and then again, you know, if you've got a 500-piece wallet order and the factory's got you know five workers and you're 80% of their business for six months, um, they're probably trying to punch above their weight and they're not going to be able to do the quality you need. There's not going to be consistency. You're going to have a lot of problems. They may bend over backwards to help you, but they just don't have that skill set that you need. So again, understanding your Venn diagram of that product, pricing, quality, and lead time, you need to do the same thing with the factory. What's the size? How interested are they in the project? You know, um, Previous experience. Previous to, experience. Sure. Are they... Are they you know, do they have a product that currently made that's close to your specifications? You know, are they, they only prove? selling to you know Zambia and you want to sell these on on High Street in London? It's not going to be a good quality match. They don't have the skill set necessarily to to make that product. They may tell you they can, but the proof's in the pudding, right? And and that's another thing too to watch out for is the golden sample. They may be able to make one piece perfectly, but that doesn't mean they can make a thousand of them every month exactly the same. Yeah. One more thing about the MOQ and, and when you're asking people to go lower, just kind of one thing to keep in mind is be honest about what your real MOQ is going to be in the future. Your real order quantity. So yes. you, if, you're, if you're going to someone who has 500 and you're like, hey, look, can you make me 100? And they say yes, don't follow up with that and be like, and I'm, you know, I'm going to go up to, a, I mean, two months I'll be doing 1,000. Like don't overshoot your promises. It's good to just be like, I do 100 every month. That's all I can do. Right so then now. they know, I mean, you know, right, you're kind of getting that out in the beginning and yeah. you can probably then, you know, find out in the beginning if that's a good match with you because they'll find them like, oh, I don't know if I want to do 100 every month. Yeah. But, you know, some, it saves you a headache down Well, this the goes with yeah, managing expectations, yeah. right? You know, you don't want the supplier to be, if you tell them you're going to be up to 10,000 in a year and you're not, they're going to be disappointed, you know, yeah. and maybe they made promises to their workers or, or the sales rep made promises to his boss and now everybody's in trouble and that's going to filter back to you. Your product quality is going to suffer. You're going to get quality fade, which happens all the time. The materials are going to get subbed out for lower quality stuff. And you're just kind of setting yourself up for a bad situation. So if you're making 100 and you're going to go up by 10% every month, great. Just try to be honest with that. And don't try to leverage yourself into getting a better price on this one order. Because you're going to get one order that goes through okay, but the next reorder, you're going to have a lot of issues and problems. And it's just a, not a long-term solution. Um, so if you're looking for a supplier that's going to be consistent quality that you can work with, I mean, we've been working with the same bag supplier for three, four years now. And I mean, we've got great relationship. I mean, knock on wood, uh, -huh. yeah. but, uh, we got a really good relationship with them. We take out orders and ship them and pay whenever it's all on the cuff. You know, I mean, we've taken out $50,000 worth of product and shipped it without paying for it. You know, we've been through ups and downs with him you know mm. but we, we communicate clearly whenever there's an issue we don't yell and scream and we don't only call him when there's a problem I mean that's that's another thing that we talk a lot about with with sourcing people who are buying products from China if you only talk to your supplier when there's an issue and they only yeah. see you as angry emails and angry yeah. phone calls 
they're not going to want to pick up the phone when you call. I got customers like that too. Every time they call, it's like, Ugh, <laughs> I don't want to talk to this guy yeah. at all right now. And, and it's not, it's just because of the way that's set up. So this all goes back to the, the re- building a good relationship. It's not about buying a fancy bottle of cognac every time you see them and doing these kind of things you see in TV and the movies and oh, the guanxi BS. Um, building a good relationship is about treating them as, as an equal partner and saying, hey, look, you know, what do you want out of this? What are you looking to get out of this? They want consistent orders. They want a reliable partner. They want you to be honest with your requirements. They want you to know what you're doing. Um, and this goes along, too, when we talk about doing inline QC, quality control. Um, if you only look at the product when it's finished and you're asking your supplier to go back and change these finished products, that's very expensive for them. If you can notice that they got the wrong color red at the beginning before they switch it, they'll buy a whole bunch of new paint, right? Because it's easy for them to fix that problem at the beginning rather than going yeah. to fix that problem at the very end, right? So when I hear all these stories about you know, Westerners say, oh, I got screwed over, blah, blah, blah. Well, you really put yourself in a bad position or you ask way too much from your supplier. And again, like we said before, most of these problems in the IP come from the Western side. And a lot of the problems with quality of the products come from lack of communication. You place that PO and then you don't talk to them until it's until the order's ready and then there's a problem. Well, yeah, you didn't kind of do anything. Yeah. yeah, you didn't do anything to ensure it was going to be right, right? It's your responsibility too to make sure that they're doing everything properly. Chinese is a very different language. Just because they say yes to everything and they say they understand, make them show you they understand. And I think a lot of it comes from like the Western attitude where I give you money, now you go figure it out. Like well, I don't have to but do then anything. it's also the, the sales system in, in the West, is mm-hmm. it works that way where yeah. um, you don't have to have a relationship with a guy you call on the phone to order your pool supplies, yeah. right? And even, even if you are a guy who owns a store and you buy it from the depot, you know, at wholesale, you might know the sales person, uh, but you don't know anything else. You, you place the PO and you get what you want. Yeah. And if it comes wrong, you send it back because yeah. there's like this very, you know, there's this developed business cycle plus plus also like all certain law, you know, laws and stuff like that. Right, that contract where you said I'm yeah. going to buy this at this time, and if you don't deliver it, it costs you. you give me a 10% discount. That's enforceable in the West. Yeah. In China. If you're expecting that from your supplier and you don't have a good, solid, long-term relationship or you're not placing orders for Ford or, or General Electric or something where the quantity is so big or, or the, the quote, you know, the great beast in China now, the white whale, is the Walmart order, yeah. you know, the million oh, per oh, month, yeah. right? So unless you have huge leverage, right, you're, you're those huge quantities, then you don't have a ton of that leverage and you really... I mean, the greatest way to protect yourself, I always tell everybody, invest in that relationship. Don't spend $10,000 on a lawyer writing a 40-page contract because maybe it's going to give you some cards to play in negotiation, but your, your best your best chance to have everything done right the first time is to have a good relationship and communicate a lot, a lot. No news is not good news from your supplier. Yeah. One thing I realized, too, is that if you're new, they'll tend to push the production schedule around, I think, based on their biggest customers. So if you're brand new, you might, they might, yeah, we got your deposit, but we're a little bit delayed. That's that's a quantity thing, right? Mm-hmm. And that's an, it's an importance thing, right? You know, again, with our bag supplier, we can do that. We've, we've, we've bumped other people's orders because yeah. we have that, we've got pull with the supplier. We've been working with them for years. A new guy, you know, yeah. why would they trust you anymore? They don't know you from, from, you know, the next guy down the street. So just because you put that order in and they've given you, remember all these quantities, lead times are estimates. Yeah. This is always what I put. You're like, just because they say, they say 35 days, <laughs> we've learned that you got to build in 10, 15% all the time. There's always a problem, always an issue. And, and this is not because the supplier is trying to lie to you or trick to you. These suppliers are so hyper-specialized that they're using other suppliers. Right? They're so, also so, hyper-specialized. Right. Yeah. So our, our cap supplier uses a subcontractor for embroidery and a subcontractor for printing and a subcontractor for packaging. And if you don't know who they are and you're not communicating with these subcontractors as well, they can, you know, there may be some delay from there or they'll fabricate a delay and they'll put it on somebody else. Again, this is part of the China non-confrontational yeah. negotiation. They don't, it's not their fault that the production's late. Oh, it's a sub-supplier, so you can't really yell at them. It's somebody else's problem. So, um, again, this is a cultural thing. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. So we're running up 
to about an hour now. So tell me about <laughs> Running with China now. This is kind of your new project. What's this deal about? Yeah, uh, well, we've joined together. Uh, Jamin and I have been partners for, for years, and um, we're working with one of my first mentors, Terry Omada, who runs a, a quite a successful sourcing company and um, his own brand of products as well to kind of help teach people. We're kind of basing this, uh, this boot camp, a live event around the Canton Fair to try to help educate people to kind of get the most out of their trips. You know, A lot of people just show up and they spent thousands of dollars to get to China, to get a visa, to get to Guangzhou, and they show up at the Canton Fair and they have no clue where to start. So we set up this boot camp. We've got our own facility in Shenzhen. We've, we've, uh, we've leased a building for the next five years. So we've got our own private facility. We're going to run classes and run exercise, give you all the templates you need to go to the Canton Fair, evaluate as many suppliers as you can, bring all that information back, process it and help you try to find a great number one supplier and two backup suppliers right again if you're trying to negotiate you don't have somebody else who knows you you know can do the job you're kind of bluffing so Mm -hmm. if you can if you've got one good supplier and you got two other backups you got a lot of power to kind of negotiate and play those guys against each other and really get the best price the best fit for your product so our goal is to take You know, our 30 years of combined living in China and and, and sourcing from China, take all that experience, put it into two intensive days at the beginning before trade shows, and then two day follow up afterwards to kind of give you the best opportunity to hit that Canton Fair, find the perfect supplier for your product, and really move on. And I think that this is a great opportunity for e commerce owners who are selling their own products to source directly from China and not get the runaround and avoid the tons of mistakes that we've made ourselves over the last decades. Uh, so, yes, really, a lot. Right. <laughs> lots and lots of mistakes. Yeah. So, are the ideal people you guys are looking for people maybe already with a business that are just looking to get into China or maybe people brand new with? Just an idea. A uh, little bit of both, you know. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna see how it goes, but I think we're gonna end up offering like an introduction to sourcing type of course, and then a really high level course because mm-hmm. there's a lot to do um, for those guys who have been sourcing already. There's ways to leverage better pricing or terms or something out and really understand your business and how it flows and what's the best way to work with a supplier long term. Everybody wants to get to that point like we were saying where we can take fifty thousand dollars worth of product yeah. out, ship it for thirty days and pay back later. It's a great way to for the cash flow to cash flow awesome. your totally business, easy. right? Yeah. It really is yeah. super helpful. So there's a ton of things that I think we have a lot to offer people who are brand new to sourcing and, and, and need to know where to start and how to find a supplier and people who have been in the game for a while and want to keep their teeth really sharp and really stay on that cutting edge of what's happening in China and sourcing but aren't living there necessarily. Yeah, like one thing just on the side, I think the real leverage point is that if you already have a brand and you can tag a product underneath that, that's like, that's fucking like aerosol right there because if you're starting from scratch you got to manufacture everything build the yeah, brand yeah, yeah. whereas right. if you already have something and you can just tag products in there like right you should totally be at the canton affair too right exactly and if you've got that traffic flow and people who are coming to your website and looking for stuff and you can kind of build out a, a ring of products around that and a couple of more offerings and you're getting them directly from china and the pricing is mm-hmm. low enough for it to make sense it, it makes a lot of sense for people to kind of be able to go directly and and find a product and build their own brands and expand their brands as well. Yeah, you're, you're getting you're using a popular brand through that's that your site's pop that your site's getting a lot of hits for, and then you're kind of building white label similar products yeah. below it. You know that relate to it or, or accessories. You know yeah. which the that main hot product that you're getting hits for maybe you only make five percent, ten percent through affiliate or or maybe the the wholesale deal you get. But then if they click on those other things below, we're talking like you know fifty. Like saying it's hundreds, hundreds, hundred percent, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think there's a huge opportunity for e-commerce owners to go directly to China and source their own products and really build out and expand the offerings to their community. Yeah, and especially now, I think where like 20 years ago it probably wasn't as transparent. Now, like you guys have been there 10 years plus. Like in terms of like getting in the market versus 10 years ago, it's like so much more not straightforward, but the roadmap is there now. I yeah, think. I mean, I think it it uh, it definitely. It's becoming easier and easier. Um, 
But how would you do this, like, in the 70s with no internet? Like, you just had to fly, no had to fly this. I had oh, no my idea. gosh, yeah. Jesus. And it's funny, though, because you think back to all those toys we played with as kids, Ninja Turtles, yeah. and He-Man, all that stuff, all these poor plastic injection molding stuff that all came from China, and think about what the, what those factory workers must have looked at when they saw a He-Man toy back in the <laughs> <laughs> You've even three. seen it on TV. Right, right yeah. 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 I mean, even today, there, there's such a cultural divide in China. It's almost, it's funny, you yeah. know, and... But I think that, again, China and the U.S. are very similar. You know, people always talk about this huge gap, but China, to me, Chinese people and Americans are so similar that, you know, they're very culturally superior. They're also very kind of xenophobic about the outside world. They're, they're very focused on their country and they see it as number one and it's the greatest kingdom in the world and there's no reason to look anywhere else. And it's kind of funny, but it's very interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that historically, like Middle Kingdom, like 5,000 years ago, this was the center of the earth, but now... I mean, China has been the largest economy in the world for 18 of the last 20 centuries. It's yeah. only been the last couple hundred years where there's been a dip, but they've always been the largest economy, the most people, you know, it's always been that way. So the U.S. is still, uh, you know, a relative newbie. Yeah, exactly. All right, so with that being said, uh, where's your website and where can we find you guys? Uh, we're at runningwithchina.com is for the boot camp, um, and highcappin.com is our sourcing company. And when you guys do sourcing, anything you guys specialize in now for anyone that's uh, listening? We specialize mostly in men's fashion accessories, mm -hmm. um, but our partner, Terry Omada, uh, he's also, you can, there should be a link on their site. Uh, what is this? Trade passages. Trade passages. Trade passages. Com. Trade passages com. Cool. All right, we'll give him a link uh, on the show notes and so we get running with China, but let's uh, run and get some food. Sounds, Sounds great. Good. All right, man. Cool. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Build My Online Store podcast. If you want the show notes, make sure to check out the website at buildmyonlinestore.com. And if you've got an e-commerce store, every two weeks I lead a live mastermind call with about five or six of the listeners in two separate groups where we work openly together and solve a business problem that you have. And we're all there to support each other. So if this sounds like a cup of tea, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com slash mastermind. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch up with you guys next week.